and a new Harvest Research Fellow and Gate Invest Tissue Engineering of Cultivated Meat. Through Vermont University, Irfan first had the chance to come in contact with farmers. And nowadays, he advocates for the collaboration between scientists and farmers, as well as general public access to science. Irfan, you may share your screen. Um, hello, everyone. As Natalia already mentioned, my name is Irfan Tahir. I am a New Harvest Research Fellow and PhD student at the Engineered Biomaterials Research Lab at the University of Vermont in America. Um, the topic that I'm going to talk to you about today is actually a really difficult one for anyone to talk about, let alone myself. Um, but, you know, I think there are important reasons why I think that uh, people should be talking about this. And the name of the top title of the topic is how can we make cellular agriculture more accessible for farmers? Before I begin, I would just like to give a quick disclaimer that I am a research scientist and uh, for me to talk about these kind of issues is completely outside of my domain. However, I think it is very important for research scientists such as myself to think about and talk about topics that might have direct implications on other people and other groups of people. So on the left here, you can see me in sort of like my natural habitat in the lab. And on the right, other than visiting a few dairy farms and talking to the farmers face to face, I am not a farmer by any stretch of the imagination. But I want to lead by example by saying that even research scientists should think about these things because the success of our work uh, is dependent upon how it's going to affect these farmers. Just a quick background on myself. I grew up in Pakistan. That is where I finished my high school education. And then after finishing my high school education from Pakistan, I got a chance to go to Turkey for my bachelor's in mechanical engineering at Bilkent University in Ankara. It was really in Turkey where I found a love for biology and a love for animals. And both of those came from my biology professor, Dr. Erdem Erikçe, who actually left his uh, job as a professor to go find a cellular agriculture startup in Turkey, which is called Beef Tech. Uh, in his startup, they're trying to find an alternative for uh, fetal bovine serum, uh, FPS, uh, using plant-based materials. And he encouraged me that, Irfan, you know, now you're going into higher studies to the US, because at that time, I had already decided that I would go to Minnesota for my master's. And he's like, we need brilliant people like you, his words, not mine, <laughs> to uh, you know, get into this field called cellular agriculture. And the more I looked into it, the more I sort of became convinced that this is what I want to do with my life. This is the research direction that I want to go in because it had the combination of having a big impact versus uh, being closely related to biology, something that I really enjoyed. So after finishing my bachelor's in Turkey, I went to the University of Minnesota in America for a master's in mechanical engineering. Uh, over there, my, the focus of my research was on biomaterials, but up to that point, I had not really uh, started doing research in cellular agriculture. After finishing my master's, I got a chance to be admitted at the University of Vermont in America for a PhD in mechanical engineering. And it was only after I joined the Engineered Biomaterials Research Lab that I prepared a New Harvest Fellowship grant. And this year, I was one of the lucky few who got selected as one of the research fellows uh, of New Harvest. For those of you who are not aware, New Harvest is a nonprofit organization, one of the only in the world that is uh, continually funding research and researchers in cellular agriculture and specifically in cultured meat. Now my project with New Harvest uh, has to do with plant-based scaffolds for bovine muscle tissue. Unfortunately, the topic of today's talk is not a scientific one per se, so we will not go into details of that, but if you would like to talk about that with me later, we can do so. So speaking of Vermont, you might ask the question, what's so special about Vermont USA, right? And I think one of the reasons why I'm sitting here in front of you is because I have the good fortune of being in Vermont. Now, there's a number of reasons why I think Burlington, Vermont, or Vermont as a state is special. Firstly, Burlington, Vermont is the first city in America to run entirely on renewable, renewable energy sources. This is quite unique and I would say quite uh, a big deal for America because most states and most cities in America are still running on uh, non-renewable fossil fuels. A little tidbit is that composting is mandatory for everyone in Vermont. This is again unique for Vermont because if you just go across the border in another state, composting is not mandatory and even the food waste ends up in the landfill. Um, for such a small city, it's really nice to see that there's eight miles of dedicated bike lanes in Burlington and people take their biking really seriously over here. 
again, I know that because I'm talking to a lot of students from Europe, this is not a big deal at all. But in America, where everyone just loves to drive all the cities, you know, highways and stuff, this is kind of a big deal, at least for America. But I would say the thing that makes uh, Vermont most special is that the people over here take an ownership of the environment and everyone has sort of like a close proximity to farms. So for example, we have a dairy farm on campus, a student run dairy farm that has 120 cows. Uh, I know a lot of people who grow their own uh, vegetables in their backyard or people who have chickens in their backyard and the only eggs that they eat are from those chickens themselves. And a lot of people, even if they buy their produce from, let's say, uh, the farmer's market or the local uh, market, they do know their supplier on sort of like a first name basis. And I think that is something that made me or implored me to think about how can I uh, have farmers in this conversation of cellular agriculture and how can I involve them? Now, I will not go into details of what is cellular agriculture just because you guys had the chance to listen to the legends of our field, such as Dr. Mark Post and Paul Shapiro just now. But just so that we're all on the same page, cellular agriculture is creating animal products without the use of animals themselves in a lab or in a industrial facility. So for example, this can be products like egg, milk, leather, you know, from the milk, you can make ice cream or, and of course, the most popular one is cultured meat, which is also known as cultivated meat or cell cultured meat, lab grown meat. I don't think we have uh, landed on one term yet. And a little distinction that I would like to make is that even though plant-based alternatives to uh, meat products are also made from living things and are also, you know, can be considered cellular uh, products, we generally don't talk about the plant-based things like Beyond Meat and Impossible Meat as cellular agriculture. Rather, it's things like cultivated meat or things made from fermentation, such as whey protein made from uh, fermentation by microflora. Um, I Again, I don't think I need to go into any details of potential benefits of cellular agriculture and why we think that this should be the next revolutionary step in our food system. But just to give you a little statistic, it has the potential to reduce land use by 99% for beef. It has the potential to reduce water consumption by 95%, again, for beef, or use 52% less industrial energy use. Other than the energy aspect of it and the environmental aspect of it, something to think about is that because we can uh, create these foods in a lab, specialty foods like milk without lactose, eggs without cholesterol are possible. And also cellular agriculture has the potential to be cruelty free. I wouldn't say that right now cellular agriculture is cruelty free because we still have a lot of puzzles that we need to solve such as alternatives to FPS, but it does have the potential to be cruelty free uh, and that I think should be a great motivator for a lot of people uh, in the audience, and it is for me as well. Now that we're talking about uh, the future of cellular agriculture and how it might affect the farmers, something to keep in mind is that this is not such a new or wild idea, and it has been actually done before. Um, so an example of this is insulin, a life-saving drug for people with type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Before 1978, we used to extract insulin from the pancreas of either pigs or cows. And I was reading a crazy statistic that you need about two tons of animal pancreas remains for eight ounces of insulin, which is completely insane. But since 1978, we figured out how to make insulin in a lab uh, using E. coli. And I think right now, 95% of all insulin that is produced in the world is through this method. Similarly, Renet, which is a enzyme uh, that we extracted from the fourth stomach of a baby calf, an enzyme that is used to curdle milk and make cheese, was uh, extracted from animals. But since 1990, it has been, uh, it's being made synthetically. And now uh, another statistic that I was reading was that 90% of all Renet in the world by cheese makers throughout the world is used synthetically. So because it has been done before, uh, that sort of like gives you, might give you an idea that the production of cultured meat, milk or eggs might also be possible and might make it just as big as insulin when it will. Although I understand that this is not a one-to-one -one, uh, comparison. Um, okay, so let's just consider two possible scenarios that are, uh, you know, might occur in the next decades to come. The first is that cellular agriculture will be just a small niche market with few implications for farmers. And it's not gonna affect them too much. 
But for the purposes of this thought experiment and this presentation, let's go with the second scenario, that there will be widespread acceptance of cellular agriculture products and that it will disrupt uh, the traditional agriculture farming uh, in a drastic way. And by traditional agriculture, I do not mean the agriculture of plants, rather I mean the livestock, dairy, and the poultry industry, those farmers. Now, the first thing that I would like to notice here is that if someone asks you, uh, so what do you think is going to be the effect of cellular agriculture on farmers? Um, my answer would be, we don't know. So as an example, this is a paper from 2019, which asked the question, how might cellular agriculture impact the livestock, dairy, and poultry industries? And literally one of the first sentences in this paper is that the market implications for cellular agriculture products are highly uncertain at this point. And it's been two years since this paper came out and we might have improved our predictions, but still, I don't think anyone can say with certainty how and how widely cellular agriculture is going to affect the traditional farmer. However, we have some statistics and facts and figures that can show us in certain industries, such as the dairy industry, especially, uh, cellular agriculture will drastically affect the farmers in a negative way. Uh, so to that point, let's take the example of dairy. What is happening and what will happen to dairy farmers in Vermont? Um, so in Vermont, dairy is really big. We're very proud of our dairy farmers. We, uh, most people over here, I would say, consume local dairy products. And even though two thirds of all milk in New England, which is all of the states on the East Coast, Massachusetts, Vermont, Maine, uh, New Hampshire, is produced by Vermont dairy farmers, the number of Vermont dairy farmers has declined drastically in the last 60 or 70 years. So much so that in the last 10 years, it has reduced by 37%. Um, just to give you uh, more uh, a zoomed in version of that statistic, there were about 12,000 uh, dairy farms in 1947 in Vermont. And I think today there are less than a thousand dairy farms in Vermont. So due to many, many reasons, these dairy farms are reducing. So think about this scenario where, you know, the dairy, the reduction of dairy farms is like a fire that's already uh, dying. And then cellular agriculture comes along and it puts water on that fire. So definitely the, these farmers are going to look at us in a negative way. And we need to do everything we can to not patronize them, but basically, you know, keep them in the loop and let them know of alternatives that they might be able to make, horizontal shifts that they might be able to make to save their livelihoods. Um, and this is really, really serious. So for example, I was reading this report from two years ago that this doesn't just affect these farmers, you know, livelihood and their way of making a living, it affects their mental health in a very, very drastic way. So two years ago, three farmers actually committed suicide because of how badly the reduction of dairy, uh, the dairy industry affected their lives. So we really, really, really need to think about these people as people first, and then farmers and you know uh, other things that we might think of them as like uh, competition to us. So what can farmers do, right? Like, are there any, is there a way that they can uh, sort of save their livelihoods? Well, some good examples come from the US. So for example, on the left here, uh, this uh, really amazing article came out in the New York, New York Times about a, a farming family in Massachusetts, in Barrie, Massachusetts, where they were dairy farmers for seven generations. But when they realized that their industry is dying, they made a completely horizontal shift to making beer instead of dairy. And they started, of course, they installed new equipment and they learned new techniques. And now they're selling this beer at five times the price of the dairy uh, that they were selling. Similar thing is, a similar thing is happening in Wisconsin in the US where uh, farmers are realizing that their industry is dying. So they're making this horizontal shift to microbrewery. Uh, of course, there are other ideas where the dairy farmers can, for example, use their land and rent it out to cellular agriculture farmers, or they themselves can get the education and make the transition to uh, maintaining the cellular agriculture farms of the future. So there are a few ideas like these, and really my uh, intention to let you know about these is so that we can open some communication channels with these farmers and we can think about having more options like these for them in a more formal way, of course. Um, and of course, uh, I mean, I know that this is 
definitely like a little bit of a controversial topic, but I think there's a lot that we can learn from the genetically modified crops movement that happened 20 years ago, because there was a lot of things that went wrong with this. And as a lot of the people in the audience are from the Europe, I think they might know this even better than the ones in the US, because in the US, we don't have any restrictions on GM crops. So one of the restrictions was that Farmers, when GM crops came, crops came into the market, farmers had limited rights to retain and reuse seeds. So this means that the companies imposed a no saved seed provision on the farmers, which means that the farmers who were growing these GM crops, they cannot save any seeds and they had to buy them every year from the company. Another thing that they did with the farmers is that they had binding arbitration, which basically precluded the farmers from fighting lawsuits if something bad happened to them. So they couldn't go to the government, they couldn't go to the legal system for help. They had to do this, behind, they had to solve the issues behind closed doors. Um, if the GM crops that uh, were given to the farmers, GM seeds had anything, had anything bad happen to other crops due to the GMC, the farmers had to accept limited liability and of course, one of the biggest things with GM crops, which we can very, very clearly see happening with cellular agriculture as well, is that farmers lost a lot of plants in certain countries. So for example, uh, I, for, for example, the US is a big exporter of GM crops, but in the Europe, uh, they don't like to import those kind of crops. So the farmers in the US, they must have lost like a lot of uh, the international market of the Europe. Whereas for example, in Brazil, where GM crops are banned, uh, the there was a lot of growth for farmers there. And I would say that one of the biggest things that we need to keep, keep in mind and take a lesson from the GM crops is that we need to somehow resist monopoly of uh, companies in the cellular agriculture landscape. So one crazy statistic is that even today in 2021, four seed companies only own 80% of the corn and 70% of the soybean markets. Uh, so these are just some like bullet points that I thought would help you think about how we can avoid these mistakes with cellular agriculture. Um, now, another question that might arise is that, so you might say, okay, I'm not, you know, I don't have that much power, but what can I do as a scientific researcher as like a one person army sort of? So the first thing that I would implore you to do is to get out of your lab and out of your comfort zone perhaps this way that I'm doing right now and to think about and talk about things that are, you know, non-scientific in nature and things that would ha have like a more social implication and initiate these outreach programs focused on communication with farmers. So perhaps look up the local farm in your community or go to the farmer's market and talk to those farmers face to face and uh, understand their uh, concerns and understand why they might be so against, uh, the advent of a new technology. Of course, there are the obvious reasons, but it's probably better to ask than to assume. Another neat idea I had is that I want to initiate a trade exchange week with local farmers in Vermont, where the dairy and the meat farmers can come into our lab and they can see the process of cultured meat being produced because we are doing that in our lab over here uh, in Vermont. And similarly, researchers such as the new Harvest Fellows or other people who are working in this space can go and interact with these farmers on a face-to-face face, uh, face -face basis. We also need to make sure as a community, as a field, that we involve big farming groups and local farming groups in cellular agriculture policy making process instead of making decisions for them without them having a say in that. Um, and the last point is that uh, we need to be very upfront and clear about the actual progress of the field. So the, I know that there's a lot of hype around cellular agriculture. Every day there's a new product, every day there's you know, a new article on the internet. But as researchers, as scientists who are reading the literature, we need to inform the farmers that, for example, we're not gonna have lab-grown burgers in the market this year. Like all of us know that for sure, even though there are some countries who have authorized uh, the authorized eating uh, lab-grown meat, right? So being upfront perhaps might mitigate some of their threats and give and allow them to have more time to make different horizontal or vertical shifts. Um, another thing that we should do, and this is really a difficult one to do just because of how much IP is uh, hidden in this uh, space, is that we should strive to make all cellular agriculture research open access and accessible. Now, the organization that is funding my research, New Harvest, they're really leading the charge with this because you will notice that every research paper that comes out of the New Harvest Fellow is open access. However, one of the ways that we can solve this is that we can implore our 
we can ask our local governments and our national governments to fund cellular agriculture research so that it's not just the private companies who are doing the research and everything is hidden behind an IP where instead can be organizations like the National Institute of Health in the US or National Science Foundation in the US. So we should really strive to do this. One thing that we can do as uh, individual researchers is that we can uh, make our science communication better. We can improve ways in which we communicate the science to the local public, to the farmers, and also, of course, to future students who might be interested in these kind of things. Um, before I end the talk, I would like to leave you with this quote that I found at the, in the New Harvest Strategic Plan of uh, the next five years. And it really struck home for me. And the quote is that we must acknowledge that positive impacts are not innately built into the advancement of technology. Now, this is a really, I think, important point because uh, just because the technology has the uh, is supposed to be revolutionary and has the potential to be extremely positive does not mean that it is going to affect like all of the groups positively in the same way. Now, one example of this is that in the late 50s, in the late 60s and 70s, when uh, photo cameras became more and more popular, something that people with dark skin noticed that photo cameras were unable to capture them as well as they were able to capture the white skin people. Now, this racial bias was ingrained into the, into the technology and it was not until like, I think 80s and 90s when chocolate manufacturers and dark furniture manufacturers started complaining to the big photo companies that they changed the technology that was able to capture dark skin people. So this is something that we should really, really keep in mind uh, as we go forward with this uh, new technological advancement. Um, and I think that's all that I have for you today. Uh, I know I raised a lot of questions and I didn't have a lot of answers today, but I would love to hear your thoughts about how can we make cellular agriculture more accessible for farmers. And if you would like to reach out, here are my uh, social media handles. Thank you so much. And thank you, Natalia, for uh, inviting me to be a speaker here. Thank you so much, Irfan, for your presentation.